Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. Our topic today is UFOs, and my guest, Dr. Jacques Vallée, is an expert in this area who, during the past 20 years, has written numerous books on the subject, including Challenge to Science, The Edge of Reality, Anatomy of a Phenomenon, The Invisible College, Messengers of Deception, and others. Welcome, Jacques. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you. I think uh, one of the interesting things to mention about you is the fact that you were the person that Steven Spielberg modeled uh, a character of a UFO researcher on in his uh, classic movie, Close Encounters of the Third Kind. I think he was uh, intrigued with the idea of a French scientist uh, running around the United States uh, investigating the UFO phenomena. You've been looking at this phenomenon for a long time. You've worked closely with uh, Dr. Alan Hynek and other UFO researchers. You've written many authoritative books, and yet your perspective on the UFO issue seems rather unique in the sense that you don't seem to be jumping on the uh, extraterrestrial visitors bandwagon. That's what, uh, what was the main point of disagreement with Steven Spielberg. When I met Steven Spielberg, he was about halfway through filming Close Encounters and we had a long discussion about what UFOs could be and of course for him uh, the, the main point of the, of the movie was entertainment and uh, it was appropriate for the UFOs to be extraterrestrial visitors. I think that uh, from my own point of view I'm going to be very disappointed if UFOs turn out to be nothing more than visitors from another planet because I think they could be something much more interesting something uh, from another dimension of space or time? Uh, I think what the UFO phenomenon is teaching us is that um, we don't understand time and space. Mm -hmm. uh, here are objects, I think we have to call them objects, that are physical, that interact with the environment, that cause uh, effects on the witnesses, on the psychology and the physiology of the witnesses and leave traces on the ground and yet are capable of, appear to be capable of manipulating time and space in ways that go beyond what our physics understands today. In your books, particularly your most recent book, Messengers of Deception, which is many years old, you suggest that UFOs are deliberately trying to manipulate uh, our subconscious mind, to create a mythology in our culture about themselves, which is one of the reasons that they're both physical and concrete, yet very elusive at, at the same time. Uh, do you still feel that way? I think to to answer that, I'm not trying to evade your question, uh -huh. but to, to answer that, you have to step back okay. you know, a, a little bit farther. The, what we know today about the UFO phenomenon is considerably more than we knew 20 years ago or 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. And we have to, to understand it at three different levels. Okay. The, the first level is the physical level. And all we can say about UFOs at the physical level is that it's a lot of energy in a small space in the space of, of this, if we could take the energy of a nuclear reactor and contain it within this studio, for example, you'd have something that would approximate what a UFO does. It's a lot of energy in a small space emitted through uh, light energy and through pulsed microwave energy. Mm -hmm. The second level is what happens to witnesses, what would happen to you and, and me if we were close to that source of energy. And again, now we, we under, we're beginning to understand the physiological and the psychological correlations of, of a, a close encounter. Yes. And those have to do with uh, a loss of the sense of space, loss of orientation. I've had witnesses tell me we were driving north when they were, everybody knows they were driving south. Mm -hmm. They were disoriented at the time. Uh, loss of the sense of time, people thinking that only 10 minutes went by and three hours went by. Uh, a very often uh, effects on the skin, sunburns, I think that was clo uh, shown in Close Encounters, yes. effects on the eyes, going from conjunctivitis to blindness, 
to temporal temporary blindness mm -hmm. in, in some cases. And sometimes you've mentioned people have actually been healed of diseases. There have been cases where the it's after a UFO close encounter, uh, it seems that the healing process had been sped up. Mm -hmm. Now there are known techniques now using electromagnetic radiation that will heal uh, the uh, fractures, for example, or will heal uh, superficial wounds on the skin, but nothing that would heal as fast as you know, the, the reported effects. Yeah. So we're beginning to understand at least the, the, the descriptions, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the symptoms of, uh, of the exposure to whatever UFO is. And then there is a, a third level, which is where I was, the, the level I was addressing in Messengers of Deception, which is a social level. The and impact on our culture. Yes, and the, the impact on the, our belief systems. Mm -hmm. And at that level, and that's something that's very difficult to, to um, convey to the believers in UFOs, the believers in little green men from space, you know, that at that level it really doesn't matter whether UFOs are real or not. Mm -hmm. If enough people believe that something is real, then it is real in its, in its effects. In terms of in its the, social reality. In, in terms of the social reality, in terms of what people act according to mm -hmm. their beliefs. Yeah. And uh, that opens a question of, really at two levels, uh, could the UFO phenomenon be manipulating us? Could it be a teaching system of some sort? Mm -hmm. Perhaps something that we are creating ourselves. Perhaps a, a series of images that we are projecting. I think Carl Jung came very close to, to expressing that idea in, in one of his books. Or could it be manipulated purposely by people who have the technology to uh, simulate UFO sightings? And mm -hmm. people say, well, of course not. Who would do a thing like that? Well, I would remind you that during Watergate, during the Watergate investigation, it was discovered that there was a plan uh, originated in the White House to uh, surface a submarine off the coast of Cuba and paint the second coming of Christ over the island of Cuba using holograms, oh, and, yeah. which is well within our technology today. The idea was that since there is a large Catholic population in Cuba, they would be so upset by this vision that this would saturate the communication channels, you know, the telephone system in Cuba, long enough for an invasion to take place. How interesting. I never heard of that. Well, I think that's, uh, you know, a classic in psychological warfare, but mm -hmm. that kind of uh, manipulation is, mm -hmm. is well understood. And I have personally investigated several apparently you know, genuine UFO cases where there was, in fact, my, my conclusion, the conclusion of scientists working with me, was that there was, in fact, a manipulation taking place and that it was not a hoax on the part of the witnesses, but a hoax on the part of somebody much better organized than them. So there are possibly all of these levels going on simultaneously. Today, the, t today with the current technology, that would be possible. Mm -hmm. um, one of my interests, as you know, has been to look at ancient sightings, uh, yes. old uh, sightings before World War II, for example, when there is really no confusion with modern technology. Mm -hmm. uh, and if people described, say, 1925 or in 1825, a, a disc flying through the air, um, then uh, you know, it can only have been very, very few phenomena could have produced it. And there have been some well-documented sightings going back to the 19th century, for example. Uh, there was, uh, starting in 1896 mm -hmm. and going into the spring of 1897, there was a, a remarkable wave of sightings of airships. Those were described as oval objects flying through the sky with lights on them. Uh, and of course, they, the people in those days could only compare it to dirigibles, mm -hmm. uh, could only compare them to airships. And uh, those objects were capable of doing all the things that UFOs do today, including taking off very quickly and making 90-degree turns and uh, landing and uh, occupants coming out of them. And if, if, any, if nothing else, uh, I think this is part of our folklore. This is something that we should be studying as part of our folklore. Mm -hmm. What have you been doing since the publication of Messengers of Deception? Well, I've been doing really working in, in two directions. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that one of the contributions that I can make is trying to develop or to, to help develop new methodology to deal with this phenomenon. This is not, we don't know where the phenomenon belongs. We don't know if it should be part of psychology or part of physics or part of meteorology or astronomy. Um, we need to develop, a, and it takes a while for science to develop new disciplines around 
phenomena that don't fit. Mm -hmm. and I think that's one of the opportunities with the UFO phenomenon. So I've tried to develop methodology that would enable us to, to deal with the complexity of the reports. Mm -hmm. And I'm doing this uh, right now in using artificial intelligence techniques to develop a very simple screening model. We, we do know one thing we, everybody agrees on is that 80% of all the cases reported are not UFOs, that they are explainable phenomena. So if you type so the data of these cases into a computer, the computer will probably screen that 80% out. Exactly. The, not, maybe not the 80%, but if you could just eliminate the 60% and okay. put them into lower priorities, mm -hmm. you would save a lot of time of investigators who could go after the the high strangeness cases mm -hmm. or high priority cases. So that's what I've been doing. As a byproduct of that, you get information on the structure of the phenomenon, the structure of the knowledge about the phenomenon mm -hmm. that I think is, is going to give us some insights into how to, to approach it. The other thing I've been doing is personal investigations. Mm -hmm. And I don't belong to any group uh, or to any organization whatsoever. I'm doing this strictly on my own with a small network of friends and uh, mm -hmm. scientists and other investigators who help me. And uh, I've been I'm fairly frequently in, in Europe. I've also traveled to South America and, of course, within the U.S. And I've tried to investigate cases that had not been reported to the media. Mm -hmm. had not been reported to UFO organizations. To avoid possible contamination from other researchers who may have made suggestions. Exactly. Mm -hmm. or, or simply the, the pressures on the witnesses themselves yeah. to embellish their stories and yeah. so on. So I, I try to go after cases that are reported directly to me. Mm -hmm. Have you come up um, with anything new or interesting in these cases? Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I go after cases where I have continued access to the witnesses and mm -hmm. continued access to the site where I can go back month after month or year after year and continue to follow those cases. Mm -hmm. One case that I'm especially intrigued with that I'm continuing to follow is the case of Dr. X in France. That's uh, an interesting one because I know I interviewed you in 1973 about this very interesting case. Well, it's a case that goes back to 1968. Mm -hmm. uh, the witness is a medical doctor of some reputation in the south of France, which is why he never wanted his name published in connection with the sighting, so yes. he was referred to as Dr. X. One night he uh, saw some uh, f flashes of red light behind the shutters in his house, and uh, so he opened the, the windows and stepped out on his balcony in the middle of the night and saw two objects that appeared to merge into a single object, and a, a beam of light went through the, the balcony where he was standing. Uh, the uh, being a scientist, uh, being a medical doctor, he had made a number of observations that during the sighting that enabled the investigators later to reconstruct exactly where the object had been mm -hmm. and the apparent size of the object. And the object was apparently very large. Uh, one of the interesting sequelae of the, of the incident is that there was a, a stigma or a marking that developed on, over his abdomen and also over the abdomen of his yes. son, his mm -hmm. son was 18 months old at the time. Um, over the years, that, that uh, area of, uh, it was like a, a red uh, geometric shape mm -hmm. uh, over, over right the skin, over the, over the stomach. Over the stomach. Mm -hmm. uh, this has been now filmed on recurrent years. It comes on back the, on the anniversary on an annual of that, basis. Uh, on the anniversary of that sighting. Now the that would be hard to explain in physiological terms, I should think. Uh, there have been several attempts to. Of course, he has. This has been observed by his colleagues in France. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them wanted to write up a communication to the French Academy of Medicine, uh, except that that couldn't be done with.